Family Resource Center invite you to join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. on Bobo, 89.1 FM, for our weekly show called Rethink Parenting, where we share practical and positive parenting information to support happy, healthy family life. We'll share how to handle day-to-day issues. We'll address common challenges with parenting, such as how to manage misbehavior, supporting our teens through growing up, managing co-parenting dynamics, and how to take care of ourselves and manage our own stressors. Family Resource Centre, committed to building people, building families. Tune in Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. on Bobo 89.1 FM. Find us at frc.gov.ky or call us on 949-0006. Submit your questions and concerns regarding parenting to us and we'll share them on air. Join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. for our weekly show called Rethink Parenting. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our second segment of Rethink Parenting. We are super excited to be um, launching our Rethink Parenting campaign. And what better way to do so than actually honoring our Recovery Month campaign? This is our 11th year um, actually um, delivering this campaign nationwide. And so we think it's a great initiative and definitely very much in line with the work that we do here at the Department of Counseling Services. I'm very excited because... Obviously, uh, our radio show is all about parenting, but with parenting and the work that we do, it's all about making sure that we're supporting our families. And we know, living in Cayman and just globally, that substance abuse affects everyone, right? It affects our community, it affects our families, it affects individuals. And so at the Department of Counseling Services, we have three entities that make up this wonderful government entity, right? And so we have the Family Resource Center, who is charged to deliver um, parenting interventions, whether it is individually or within a group setting. And so our core mandate is parenting at the at the heart of it all. But in addition to that, we've got two other sister agencies, and I'm really, really excited about having our sister agencies here today. We have Renee Ebanks, who is a former FRC <laughs> staff, and I got to plug that in there. Uh, the genesis began at FRC, and I'm really excited to have Renee here, so it feels like home already. Uh, Renee is a counselor at the uh, Counseling Center, and so Counseling Center offers outpatient services. Um, a lot of the work that they do, it's very, very broad, but a a lot of their clients are definitely substance abuse clients. And so she services families both individually as well as within a group, uh, group setting. So thank you so much, Ms. Ebanks, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right. And to my left, I have the clinical supervisor at Caribbean Haven Residential Center. And folks, this year, we're actually shining the spotlight on CHRC. CHRC is a residential treatment center, the only treatment center. Is it correct to say that they're act- we actually are the only treatment center in the Caribbean? Well, in the Cayman Islands. In the Cayman Islands. But there's something unique also about the work that we're doing. Absolutely. Right. And so Kimberly is going to talk a little bit more about the new treatment model. The Sorry, the new treatment model that a CHRC is going to be launching. And so we have a really exciting open house that's taking place towards the end of the month. And um, I guess let's go ahead and get started. Kimberly, could you please say hi? I'm sorry. Hi, uh, introduce thanks yourself. for having me. My name is Kimberly Febres, and I'm very happy to be here to, to talk about Recovery Month and um, hopefully give some helpful advice to parents out there who are also in recovery. Absolutely. Uh, So Kimberly is a clinical supervisor at CHRC and has been with CHRC for how long? Is that four or five years? No, over seven years. Oh my gosh, time flies. Time flies when you're doing great work. It does. Right? So thank you so much, Kimberly, (laughs) for your contributions. Um, So in terms of recovery month, we know that generally when we're talking about recovery month, oftentimes we think recovery month for those that are in the field, you know, we're well equipped in understanding that it's it's not just substance abuse. It goes beyond that. So Kimberly, talk to us a little bit more about the, impor- the importance of recovery month and what exactly is trying to capture. Mm-hmm. So one of the most important things about recovery month is that it's for everyone. Um, even if you are not the person yourself who struggles with substance use or mental illness or trauma or any co-occurring issues, um, likely you know someone who has or it's impacted you in some way. So our tagline this year is that recovery is for everyone, every person, every family, every community. Um, And part of observing Recovery Month is to help educate people about what support is out there, um, how we can connect, how we can become stronger as as families, as a community, 
um, to remove the stigma and the barriers um, that exist for people mm-hmm. who, who need support. Absolutely. So you mentioned a very important word there, stigma, mm-hmm. right? And I think as a community, we've, we've done a lot of work to, to address those, the, you know, the stigma attached to accessing services such as CHRC, such as the Counseling Center. Renee, talk to us a little bit more about, you know, what have you seen in terms of the clients that are walking through outpatient services at the Counseling Center? How comfortable are they starting to feel with actually accessing services with you? Okay. So, yes, thank you for that question. Um, so when it comes to individuals accessing services at the Counseling Center, we we start to notice a grow in number in the people who are actually accessing our group's services. So, for example, we have a group called Intense Outpatient Program, which is addressing those who have substance abuse issues and who need the support in a more intense fashion, right? And we notice that the number in those groups have grown and they've become more comfortable in sharing what their experiences are, what has happened to them, as well as um, knowing that there is support there for them. So there is still a stigma. We're still addressing that. But at the same time, people are becoming more comfortable and knowing that and becoming more aware that, you know, this is an issue that I'm having. So I am reaching out for help. So, Renee, you've mentioned, you've mentioned intensive outpatient services, and TCC does so much, so much valuable work within our community. Talk to us a little bit more about the process of accessing services and just additional programs that you guys are offering to support families that are in recovery. Okay. So, for most services in the department, not just for TCC, but um, every individual who becomes a client needs to first do an intake, right? So, go through the rules and regulations of the department and see where which program or which agency they fit into from there they will be assigned a either a facilitator if it's at the family resource center or a counselor or therapist at the counseling center and then the counselor will actually have that session with them to assess which group they're appropriate for or whether they are group appropriate at all and that way if they're not group appropriate the individual sessions will come in From there, we also have different groups. So I mentioned Intense Outpatient Program, which is also known as IOP for short. Then we have other programs such as Relapse Prevention as well as Early Recovery. These all happen at different times throughout the week, um, throughout the day that they're held on, as well as they have different, different, I guess, um, areas or different perspectives like in which they are trying to come at. So, for example... Intense outpatient program is for those who are starting recovery, who are trying to get sober, who are having a difficult time and need that intense support. Relapse prevention is when they've went through that process and they're in more recovery phase and then they just need the support, maybe not as intense. And an early recovery is similar to relapse prevention where they just need this additional support to keep them on their recovery journey. So, Kimberly, tell us how different CHRC services are to the outpatient services that TCC offers, the Counseling Center, um, and what is the process to accessing services at CHRC? So, it's it's a higher level of care, uh, basically. It's, it's residential treatment, so it's for people who are really struggling to, um, to function in the community. Maybe they, their substance use or their mental health Um, has started to impact areas of their life such as employment, their finances, their housing, their family and other relationships. And they're really just finding that they're having difficulty in a lot of areas. So in in that case, if they need that very high intense level of care, um, then residential treatment might be an option. It removes them from their everyday life and and helps them to break the cycle of whatever is happening so they can really just focus on on their wellness um, and their treatment. And as far as accessing services, it's it's as easy as making a phone call. Um, you just would call us at 947-9992, and we do a phone screening with you. And we just ask you a, a, some basic questions about yourself and how we can help. And then you come in, and we've got a whole team there ready to, to support you in your recovery journey. Okay, can you talk to us a little bit more about sort of like the criteria for those that are listening? Right. Whether it is yourself, 
whether it is someone that you feel could really benefit from treatment services. Walk us through what that phone conversation is like with that client. Sure. So for most people, they will start with a non-medical detox. So the first step in recovery for most people is to get the substances that you've been using out of your system. So whether it's alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, those are some of the the primary drugs that we see. Also, people may come in who have addictions to prescription pills and other medications. Um, So during the phone call, we'll ask about your recent substance use, and it's not to shame you or blame you Mm -hmm. or judge you in any way. It's just to get to know you and find out what's been going on in your life. Um, And then we'll also ask you some other questions, just sort of what's been happening in the last few days, what prompted you to want to come in, if you have any other mental health needs or medical needs, so that we're aware of how we can best support you during your detox. Um, So once we have a conversation about that, if if you can come and, and safely detox with us, then we'll let you know. Um, If you need a medical clearance, we will advise you of that as well, because it is important to know that when you stop using certain substances, Mm. all of a sudden... Your body's experiencing... Wow, yeah. Sometimes it can actually be life-threatening in some cases. So it's important to have that conversation with us so that you will know that you're doing it in the safest way possible for yourself. Okay. What about age? Tell us about age. How early, I mean, how young can you be when you're um, in order to enter the re- uh, rehabilitation center? Or the right now, center? we only serve adults. So okay. anyone over the age of 18. 18. Okay. And it is completely voluntary. So right. if you're a parent and maybe you have a child or another loved one or someone else in your life that you want to refer, right. have that conversation with them or call us and we can talk to you about having that conversation with them mm-hmm. so that they are the ones who would be ready to then reach out and make the call. So in terms of, I mean, the idea of accessing a treatment center, you know, can be a bit scary for Absolutely. those individuals that are not aware of it and, and are not aware of your process. And there is a sense of disconnection from family, from friends. Mm-hmm. What processes do you guys have in place at CHRC, a Caribbean Haven Residential Center, to support clients or individuals that have decided to, you know what, let's commit to this treatment. Mm -hmm. I need this. Something's got to change in my life. What process or system do you guys have in place to to help support that relationship that that individual may have with family, with friends, or with some positive person in their lives? What, Mm -hmm. what can, what's in place right now to, to help continue that relationship? A few things. So first of all, um, we are going to come at it from a very person-centered approach. So we we have a non-judgmental stance that we take as staff um, with all of our clients. So we understand that people are seeking services because they're having some problems in their lives and that they may or may not have caused all of the problems they're experiencing, but they still have to solve them anyway. So we come at it from that stance, that we're, we're just there to help you to identify um, what it is in your life that you might want to change and help you create a life worth living, help you build a satisfying life. So our first priority is, is you, the client, mm-hmm. right, and, and helping you to take care of yourself because if you are able to take that first step and invest a bit in yourself, then you will be able to to start repairing other relationships and and building back other connections or maybe bridges that have been broken in the past. So we do bring families in. Um, if if there are families involved, that's fantastic. And that's we, awesome. We maintain those connections. So we have um, opportunities for family sessions for the clients who are in treatment and they're able to contact their families on weekends and have time to visit with them awesome. um, so that they can keep that relationship right, exactly. going and fostering that. Right. That is wonderful to hear. In terms of the programs that you guys are offering while an individual has decided to, you know, enroll at the treatment center, what can they expect? Like Mm -hmm. walk us through a daily, just a daily routine for someone that's in treatment. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. Yes, it is. Um, we're, we're super excited. We actually launched a totally revamped treatment program a week ago, so in honor of Recovery Month. Mm-hmm. And we're using a treatment model called dialectical behavior therapy. So in short, because it it we'll, I'll call it DBT, mm-hmm. um, but basically what that means is that we're, we're looking at the causes of behaviors and trying to figure out um, why 
people have made certain choices or why they may behave in certain ways. Um, and looking at that rather than blaming or judging the person for, for what's happening in their life. So we, we have different um, modules that we do in, in the treatment program. We look at um, paying attention to living in the moment. We look at coping with stress, regulating emotions, our relationships with others, and then planning to, to have a sober lifestyle. So every day... Um, in the program, you would you would get up, you would have your meals provided for you, so you don't have to worry about anything. Um, you would attend two groups a day where you would be working on one of those goals. Um, and then you would have individual time several times a week with our staff to help you to process on an even deeper level. So you would have individual um, skills training where you're learning coping skills um, to deal with whatever the problems are that you're having in your life, and you would have individual therapy with our very talented um, team of therapists to help you process anything that's related to trauma or any deep issues that you have going on that, that may need to be addressed. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for walking us through that. Folks, we're going to take a short break, and we will be back and talk just to talk a little bit more about what can you do to support someone that is going to begin this journey? How can you support them and commit to that change also, as well as why is it that people actually engage in substance abuse? Renee Ebanks is going to support us and enlighten us with that information. The Family Resource Center invite you to join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. on Bobo. 89.1 FM for our weekly show called Rethink Parenting, where we share practical and positive parenting information to support happy, healthy family life. We'll share how to handle day-to-day issues. We'll address common challenges with parenting, such as how to manage misbehavior, supporting our teens through growing up, managing co-parenting dynamics, and how to take care of ourselves and manage our own stressors. Family Resource Center, committed to building people, building families. Tune in Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. on Bobo 89.1 FM. Find us at frc.gov.ky or call us on 949-0006. Submit your questions and concerns regarding parenting to us and we'll share them on air. Join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. for our weekly show called Rethink Parenting. And we are back again live on our Rethink Parenting radio segment. This is our second radio show for the month. We're super excited to be partnering with Bobo 89.1 FM. Thank you so much to those listeners. If you have any questions, please give us a call at 745-2626. The number is... 745-2626. My name is Charmaine Miller. I am the clinical supervisor at the Family Resource Center, and I have the privilege to have two of my colleagues that are representing our sister agencies, Renee Ebanks from the Counseling Center. She is a counselor at the Counseling Center, and we have Ms. Kimberly, uh, who is the clinical supervisor at CHRC, Caribbean Haven Residential Center. Thank you, ladies, for being here with us, and please, listeners, give us a call, or you can also use our Instagram account, FRCKMAN and send us a text message. Renee, talk to us a little bit more about, you know, understanding understanding addiction, right? What, for those people that are listening right now, what can they do to support families um, or support individuals that are currently um, impacted by substance use or are using? That's the term that we use, right? Um, what can they do to support them? How can they convey commitment, trust, not guilt or, or or blame and whatnot, which is really hard to do when you yourself are living in that in that environment. What can someone do that's listening? And in addition to that, why do people actually engage in substance use and substance abuse? Well, the second question is a very loaded question. That would be a whole, that's a whole session in psychology. Minutes. That's a whole <laughs> session of psychology right there, Charmaine. <laughs> but anyways, um, to your first question, which was, what can people do to support others? And Kim, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so when it comes to supporting others with substance abuse issues or who are going through recovery, I think the one of the most important things to look at is actually approach it from a non-judgmental um, lens. At the same time, yes, you may not fully understand what that person is um, going through, why they're engaging in certain substances, why they are doing certain things. But I think it's very important to actually sit down and actually have a conversation with them, actually listen to them. And um, 
be mindful of the language that you use as well, right? So um, not to shame them, not to blame mm-hmm. them, not to say, you always do this, you never do that, look at you again. I think it's really important to come from that perspective of, okay, how can I be understanding? How can I be empathic for this individual right now? And you don't necessarily have to say too much either. You just have to provide a listening ear for them in those moments. And if they're struggling with a negative thought, if they're struggling with um, wanting to use again, providing that encouragement for them, remind them of their tools that they've learned throughout the sessions, remind them of the resources that are available on islands, such as our department, right? And I think that's an um, that could be a barrier too, because I don't know if like the general public has an understanding of what resources are out there in Cayman. And I know that we are building our rapport, we're building our reputation. But um, sometimes people don't understand or know what is actually available out there. So our department, Department of Counseling Services, as Kim was saying earlier, we are the only residential treatment center, or CHRC is the only residential treatment center in the Cayman Islands where all the things she talked about earlier in terms of working on your relationships with family, working on a value-based life, working on, um, you know, avoiding Um, people places things like all these coping strategies all these coping tools you can actually get that at the counseling center as well you just don't need to go to residential for that you can actually access groups as well and if you feel that okay i know someone who is going through this i know someone who um i can support with it's important for you to get that support as well right for you to access services and say hey i have a parent who is an alcoholic I'm not sure how to deal with this. Um, going to a therapist and having them breaking down the relationship, um, you know, the barriers that may prevent you from actually being open with that person, um, connecting with that person, and providing you with the tools to actually be supportive. But at the same time, learning how to support yourself, right? Creating boundaries for yourself there. So that was one way. Kim, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just like to add, you know, the question you asked Charmaine about why do people get into substance use in the first place? Um, There are a lot of reasons. Like Renee said, we could be here all night to Mm -hmm. discuss just that topic. But one of the... Right, right. We can to camp out. So hopefully you all are ready to camp out with us for the long show. Um, But one of the reasons is, you know, people often use substances because... Whatever they're going through, whatever they're feeling is very hard to feel. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they may have come from a background or grown up in a family where expressing emotions wasn't okay, Mm -hmm. where maybe they were told, oh, cheer up, everything will be fine or Mm -hmm. suck it up, you know, or I'll give you something to cry about. You know, these are things that like people say and Mm -hmm. and it's it's not meant to be harmful. But Mm -hmm. over time, when we hear those messages, we learn um, to kind of suppress our emotions And then as adults, when things happen that are really stressful and we don't have the ability to tolerate that distress, Mm -hmm. sometimes we try to numb it or -hmm. or push it down and substances are are a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that we really encourage in all of our programs is that expression of feelings is is okay. It's normal. Um, Even if what you're feeling isn't comfortable, even if you're feeling angry, you're feeling sad or anxious, that these are human emotions Mm -hmm. and, you know, any feeling isn't really good or bad. They Mm -hmm. they just are feelings and we have to recognize and accept them. Yeah. And I think um, that's so important to Kim that you talk about, you know, suppressing and our emotions, trying to avoid and ignore them. Right. And what I've noticed in outpatient is that, you know, the stigma about men. Right. Men can't share feelings or be a man, go drink a beer or something like that. You do find that men have a a hard time and not just men, but you do see them um, in our groups a little bit more in that sense. Right. Because they have that whole cultural stigma that I can't share my feelings. I have to be a man. Right. right? So they have to be recognized first. And so here's just a, a, a little image for for men. You know, if you a lot of men and women too. Yeah. Maybe I'm being sexist, but <laughs> men like their cars, right? So mm-hmm. you, you wouldn't you if you were driving your car and your tire went flat, mm-hmm. would you keep driving on it? No, of course not. You would. Some people do until they make it to like the next. I don't know. Stop. Well, but it's you know you're going to do more damage to your car. So True. If you have a flat tire, so the point is, if you have a flat tire, you have to first accept that the tire is flat and then change it. Absolutely. So feelings are the same. First, you have to acknowledge that they're there before any change can happen. 
Absolutely. We've got two questions, ladies. I'm very excited. Um, So there's activity happening. Um, Two questions here. Uh, The first question is, how does a person develop an addiction to substances? Ooh, so yeah, so I've I've touched on that a little bit as far as, you know, some of the behavior patterns, but there's also other factors too. So sometimes people have a biological Mm -hmm. sensitivity, so where they might be predisposed to addictive behavior, and that might be substance use, or it might be any other addictive behavior. It might be gambling, it might be um, pornography, it might be, you know... you might be addicted to the internet, to being on your phone, right? Right. So um, just imagine, you know, most of us have some small level of addiction to your phone. So just imagine like trying to put your phone down for an hour and not look at it at all and how that might make you feel Mm -hmm. um, for just a tiny little window of what someone goes through who has an addiction. So there's that part of it. And then there's also um, a chemical dependency that happens with substances in particular where they will um, kind of give us the same sort of pleasure reward um, that something like exercise would give us or, you know, like the joy that we feel, you know, and we get this flood of endorphins um, using certain substances will give us that that reward. So our brains and our bodies want us to keep seeking it so we can keep being rewarded over and over and we develop a a dependency. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I have managed to persuade our new... How long have you been on island, Samuel? Two months. Two months. (laughs) And this is how we do it. So Samuel has just joined us. Samuel, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, guys. My name is Samuel McDermott, and I work with the Counseling Center. Awesome. So he's one of our counselors, uh, therapists at um, TCC at the Counseling Center. And so I'm posing the same question to you because you've got quite an international experience, right? You've done a lot of your, your... uh, work in Jamaica. And so the question was, how does a person develop an addiction to substances? Let's look at your experience. And obviously, Kim has spoken to the theoretical aspect of it as, as in addition to what she's seen from a CHRC perspective. But talk to me a little bit about your experience and, you know, in, in your line of work, how do, what was the common trend or did you find commonalities in terms of individuals developing substance abuse and addiction? Well, in general, Persons try to, well, we have this principle as human beings where we try to avoid pain as much as possible and we try to engage in things that are comfortable and pleasurable. In the short term, it may seem as if something that's difficult to face. So, for example, a traumatic experience, an experience with um, the death of a loved one, an experience where we've witnessed something and ex- just experiences that are uncomfortable in general. We try as best as possible to avoid them. And in trying to avoid them, we go to something that is much more pleasurable. For example, alcohol, something that can kind of detach us from that feeling. Mm -hmm. And in getting the pleasure from that, we tend to get addicted sometimes. So that's one way in which persons can get addicted to substances. Trauma. 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 And escape from it. Right. Um, Not wanting to feel. Not wanting to feel the pain, the memories, everything that comes along with it. So, guys, I want to contextualize it now and... You know, obviously it's a parenting show. Um, Let's talk about how substance abuse and parenting, just the interplay between both, right? And so parenting can be challenging. We know parenting can be challenging. In my line of work, I'm working oftentimes, especially with at-risk mothers, right, through our Young Parents Program who develop unhealthy coping strategies, whether it is smoking marijuana, whether it is drinking excessively, right? And oftentimes it's to manage that sense of just being feeling overwhelmed, extremely stressed. And it takes away from their ability to connect, Mm -hmm. to connect with their children, to build that attachment. For those that are experiencing that and are not yet ready to access counseling services or residential treatment, what are some things that you could recommend to them? I'm so blessed. I have three therapists oh, around started? me. This is cool. All right. Well, I know that we have, um, once again, two months in. <laughs> I know that we have, <laughs> we have workshops that are available. So for persons who probably learn more in our group setting, they can access services through workshops where they can learn, learn from each other. You have experts among you who you can learn from. You can learn from your neighbor. You can learn from someone who's trained. In a group setting. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Going back to that. um, 
adding to that too, some people may not feel comfortable actually being in the room yet with others, right? And I know that this month we actually have a few webinars coming up. We have one for parenting in terms of how to talk to your children, talk early, talk often, um, in terms of talking to your children about recovery and um, substance abuse, as well as um, the Counseling Center is actually having a Therapeutic Thursday webinar based around substance use this month as well. So if you're uncomfortable actually engaging in group settings in person, these things are available online as well. Um, I guess another thing too, you know, when they talk about um, developing unhealthy coping strategies, kind of thinking of what healthy coping strategies can you replace? I know it's easier said than done and not everyone has access to let's go to the gym and pump weight and pay for all this stuff, but even or the energy, right? But maybe when it comes to, for example, the young moms, finding ways to connect with their children, like it could be simply, you know, going outside, um, going for a walk, having more activity based around that. So they they release those same neurotransmitters, they release those same chemicals that they can get from substances. Mm-hmm. And we're actually having a great opportunity for that um, week after next. So on September 24th, we are having in honor of Recovery Month a family fun day at the Turtle Center. So that would be a perfect opportunity to do just what Renee said and have some time to connect with your family um, in healthy and positive ways, enjoy each other. Um, and we'll we have some details about that. You can give us a call at nine four nine eight seven eight nine if you want to sign up to come to that. And um, the other bit of advice that I I have that sort of goes along with that is sometimes when we're struggling, um, when things are hard and we're under a lot of stress, um, we want to withdraw, kind of shut ourselves in um, and isolate and not reach out. And so what I would encourage people to do in that case is do the opposite. You know, so sometimes even though you feel like you want to pull in and come in, I would encourage you to reach out, even if it's just to someone in your community or even if it's just to come out to our family fun day. So even before attending yeah. counseling or workshops, just come do something fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's, then there's one more core point, you know, where anyone can start, which is just with mindfulness. Mm-hmm. So just paying attention to what's happening within yourself, right? Because you've got, as parents, you've got a lot to pay attention to. You've got your kids, you've got your households and your jobs and and lots of other things, but it it starts with you. Mm -hmm. So in order to be able to function in with all that you have going on, it's important to just be mindful about what is happening with you Mm -hmm. um, so that you can be in a position where you're you're addressing any self-care needs you have and then you can be better equipped to deal with with everything else because in the end you're responsible for for your own feelings and not anyone else's yeah and to add to that too kim you're spot on to add to the mindfulness bit as well as when you're practicing those mindfulness activities it can um it's important to also reconnect with your values right what do i want my children to leave with what do i want to instill in my children because at the end of the day you using um substances right and this is not judgment or anything this is more so of reminding that whatever you do you're modeling that behavior for your children right you're modeling okay when i'm stressed i'm going to go take a drink right and it's important to like what do i want for my children what values do i want for myself and what do i want to instill in them Absolutely. Um, so I want to share a really interesting, I mean, if some of you may know this already, parents, but it's always really interesting to know the facts, right? And so according to the Cayman Islands um, Student Drug Survey, the 2022 dr- um, Student Drug Survey, alcohol is the most commonly used substance among students between the ages of 11 and 18, mm-hmm. right? For me, that hits home. I have an 11-year-old, right? And so to recognize that this is something that's common, right? That as early as 11, you can be introduced to that, right? And so I know there are certain personalities that can be more addictive too, right? And so just exposure to that could just be a segue into a whirlwind of problems, right? And so in terms of gender too, what the research is saying is that girls are engaging more in substance use than boys. 
Very interesting. interesting. Based on our survey, right? I have my own theory around that in terms of what we're seeing at the counseling center. I mean, at the Family Resource Center. Look at me jumping up. No. Uh, <laughs> at the Family Resource Center because... Um, In our work, uh, we have a clinical program called SNAP, Stop Now and Plan. And so this year was the first time that we were actually able within our summer camp to run two girls group. Generally, uh, that program attracts a lot more boys than girls because boys tend to externalize a lot of their behaviors, right? So it's more noticeable and uh, it's more problematic for a classroom setting or for teachers or whatnot. And this time around, we were able to have girls, right? And so oftentimes girls generally will internalize their feelings. They, they'll internalize their behaviors. There's a lot of cognitive distortions that they may have, a lot of self-esteem issues, self-worth and whatnot. And so we've been talking about coping today, right? And this could be the reasoning behind it, right? That our girls are using, are, are being exposed to it as early as 11, more so than our boys. What are your thoughts as professionals? What are your thoughts around that? I'm wondering if it has anything to do with the peer pressure of it all. Like, I know there's more access to, and I'm not trying to blame social media for everything, but (laughs) (laughs) but there is more exposure to um, certain celebrities or people that they um, look up to who are engaged in substances, right? So I am wondering if that has anything to do with it, as well as the other psychological factor that comes from social media as well, right? There's much more, I find... I find that um, more children are experiencing anxiety due to like um, due to social media, um, all the perfectionism tendencies that they're experiencing, um, all the comparison, and I'm wondering if that has anything to do with girls, especially because girls tend to. How do I say this? I don't want to say that girls tend to. Um, My tear fast though. I mean, you, yeah, you said it, <laughs> but, um, but you know, yeah. Sometimes I think there's. A particular expectation of a girl to be a certain way, look a certain way, dress a certain mm-hmm. way, and maybe there's a lot of pressure there, and mm-hmm. substances come into play to help deal with those things. Yeah. Absolutely. So going back to the facts, right? On average, a child will will experiment on alcohol as early as 11 year old. What can we do to? How would I mean, how would I, as a parent, begin by having a conversation with my child, right? At FRC, we always talk about, you know, knowledge is power, educating our kids, right? Doing so in an age-appropriate way, mm-hmm. right? So how do, we, how do we strike a balance between educating them while still not necessarily shunning them and totally bubbling them, you know, bubble wrapping them? Because that's an issue already, mm-hmm. right? We live in a very small island. And I know for me recently, you know, just... Uh, COVID restrictions are lifted. We're traveling and it felt so different because we've been locked up for like three years to a certain extent. I was kind of like, oh my gosh, I need to get used to this level of noise, all these people that I'm around and X, Y, and Z. But um, in terms of having that conversation for those parents that are listening right now, what should that conversation sound like if a child does come and say, hey, Johnny started talking to me about drugs and said that his dad is always using it at home. What should we be, How do, I mean, Samuel and Kimberly, for both of you, what do you recommend in terms of best practice? Well, I think, first of all, I mean, we don't want substance use, you know, alcohol or drug use to become the proverbial elephant in the room, that, that it would be okay to share your story um, with, your, with your family, with your children, and, and teach them what it means um, to drink responsibly, right, because alcohol is legal, um, and so, you know, to, to have those conversations with them about, you know, and, and not try to hide it. You know, some parents may feel like, well, I don't want to have a, a drink in front of my, my child or I don't want to have a beer in front of my child. And, but it's, it's almost better to, to not be secretive about it and make it like something that's, you know, forbidden or something that, you know, right, to demonize it. And so, but, but to have the conversation and say, you know, mom, mommy's having a drink with her dinner and, you know, this is, this is something that's okay to do for some people and, you know, that you can teach them about being socially responsible from a young age rather than trying to avoid the topic. Fear tactic, right? right. Just constantly making them kind of like just the message of you cannot and you will not because this is going to lead to, you know, you becoming an addict um, as opposed. I mean, I like the word that you you use, the so, just being socially responsible, right? That is so important. And 
at FRC, we're always talking about that when it comes to everything, mm-hmm. right? Um, when it comes to addressing the topic of bullying, what's your responsibility? What role do you play, right? And in the same token, like when we're talking about parents, if I want to be a social drinker, be a social drinker, but do so in a responsible way where it's not it's not this message of don't do what I'm doing right now, right? right? We always, I mean, Renee spoke on modeling and that is so critical in everything that we do. We do have a question, Um Is it a problem that I smoke occasionally? I don't do it in front of the kids right now. I don't know if they're talking about smoking cigarettes um, or smoking illegal drugs, but is it a problem? And uh, will my kids start using if I do it? Mm. Well, I, I think a good way of looking at it is why are you smoking occasionally? What is it that you're smoking to cope with? What is it that you're smoking to... I don't want to use run away from, but let's use the word avoid. The coping mechanisms that we use, our children can actually model it. We, we mentioned modeling earlier. And if it is that we're not engaging in healthy ways of coping, our children can actually learn that from us. The home is the first place that the child learns. Absolutely. And if the child learns from you that uh, healthy conversations are some things that can be avoided... And I can try to engage in dirty pain like smoking instead Mm -hmm. of engaging in healthy conversations, then my child may very well just follow suit. And I also think it's important to actually look at the consequences of smoking. Say if the person is, is talking about marijuana here, right? What would happen if I got caught with this? Right. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm, I think that's mm -hmm. an important thing to look at because it's still illegal here in the Cayman Islands. So, Am I putting myself at risk? In the long term, if I get caught, what happens to me? What happens to my family? I think that's really important to look at as well. Yes, Mm -hmm. it can feel enjoyable and it can help and whatever not, but I think looking at the consequences of it is so important as well. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good point. Um, We always, because at FRC, we work with kids all the time. We always talk about, you know, making choices that will keep your problems small. Right. And sometimes our parents can be really, really overwhelmed. Um, I, I wholeheartedly believe that parenting is a lot more challenging now <laughs> than with the era that my parents parented or my mom did. It's a lot. It's a lot. We, we don't have so. Yeah. I mean, we have so many teachers now. Right. And there's a lot of lack of monitoring that's happening, unfortunately. And that could be the reason behind the stat in terms of, you know, as early as 11, that's the average age, um, our children here are experimenting with substance use. Um, What I'd like to do now, folks, is we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk about the activities that are organized um, throughout the month of September. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Please give us a call at 745-2626. We are here on Rethink Parenting um, weekly evening show so if you have any questions give us a call otherwise please send us a message at our instagram account frc Cayman. the family resource center invite you to join us tuesday nights at 8 p.m on bobo 89.1 fm for our weekly show called rethink parenting where we share practical and positive parenting information to support happy healthy family life We'll share how to handle day-to-day issues. We'll address common challenges with parenting, such as how to manage misbehavior, supporting our teens through growing up, managing co-parenting dynamics, and how to take care of ourselves and manage our own stressors. Family Resource Center, committed to building people, building families. Tune in Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. on Bobo 89.1 FM. Find us at frc.gov.ky or call us on 949-0006. Submit your questions and concerns regarding parenting to us and we'll share them on air. Join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. for our weekly show called Rethink Parenting. And we are back. My name is Charmaine Miller. I am the clinical supervisor at the Family Resource Center. Very excited to be leading today's radio uh, Rethink Parenting segment. I'm joined by... Three therapists from our sister agency. We have uh, on my left, we have Miss Kimberly, who's a clinical supervisor at Caribbean Haven Residential Center, which is the only treatment center here within the Cayman Islands. We're very privileged as a government entity to be offering our services for free, and CHRC is a free service, right? right? (laughs) All of all of Department of Counseling services. Yes, everything that we do is free. We're grateful to be part of a you know obviously. 
part of the government and we fall under the Ministry of Health and Wellness and thanks to our government we're able to provide the services and programs that we offer for free. I also have on my right uh, Ms. Brene Ebanks who's a counselor at um, the Counseling Center and she's spoken quite a bit around the outpatient services. Now Renee I know we've Obviously, we're familiar with the terminology inpatient and outpatient, but can you elaborate a little bit more and just speak to the difference for just the average person that's listening right now? Okay, so when it comes to outpatient, that just basically means someone who can access services on a given basis. They can walk in, go to group, and then go back to what where they have to go, right? That's home, home. <laughs> or or work or wherever yeah. it is, right? Whereas, whereas inpatient is, I am going to reside in this space for a period of time. And uh, we also have a therapist from the Counseling Center. He is new to the island, and we have put him on the spot. That's the way we roll here at the Family (laughs) Resource Center. So I'm really excited that you just decided to jump on, Simon. That's great. Showing that initiative. Well done. Sam. (laughs) (laughs) I apologize. Um, All righty then. So let's, Kimberly, walk us through what's taking place this month, um, you know, an observance of this very, very important campaign. Let's remind folks today that the theme is recovery is for everyone, every person, every family, every community, right? And the overall objective of this campaign is really to spread this message that people can and they do recover every day, right? So it's that, I mean, it's really a positive message, Kimberly. So talk to us a little bit more about the events that are, are, are being organized for this month? Sure. So some of the events that we have going on are to help educate our community about recovery and the different support services that are available, such as tonight's radio program. Um, and Renee spoke to the upcoming webinars that we have as well this month. Um, another really important goal for Recovery Month is to celebrate people in recovery and connect as a community to support um, and build those bridges, help people to build resilience. Saturday, September 24th, we have a family fun day. At wow. Talk to us about that. The Turtle Center. Is it free? It is. What? It's free. <laughs> that's amazing. It's free, people. So you just need to call and register. That's okay. it. So that's it. So just call us Parents, and register. Parents, that is what we're going to do with our children. Yes. Okay, we are going to Spend go. Spend the day at the Turtle to Center. To Turtle Center and you learn about all, your work. Right. You can do all the regular Turtle Center stuff. And we'll also have games and food. Absolutely. And maybe some prizes. Definitely. We'll see. So we hope uh, many of you will come out and join us for that event. Absolutely. Um, all also, we are doing an open house at Caribbean Haven Residential Center on September 30th from 1 to 4 p.m. So if you are interested in seeing the facility, seeing what we have on offer there, learning more about our dialectical behavior therapy program, you can come by, take a tour, watch the presentation, um, enjoy some snacks with us, and, and enjoy some time uh, celebrating and observing Recovery Month. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Very, very exciting news. Um, Parents, families, anyone interested in, you know, we've talked about if you're not ready yet to access treatment at Caribbean Haven Residential Center or even therapy at the Counseling Center, this would be a great opportunity for you to come out, enjoy some time with your family while at the same time learning a little bit more and being introduced to our team. We're all going to be out there. We're, We're very personable, I promise. We are not scary people. Um, And we're going to have an opportunity to just talk, you know, to just talk and learn a little bit more about potential, depending on how much you disclose, what support is out there and um, as well as how you can just begin your journey if that is something that you're interested in pursuing. Um, We've got our Therapeutic Thursday, which is taking place September 15th in two days. Renee, talk to us about Therapeutic Thursdays. Okay, so this is a new, um, I guess you could call a new segment that the Counseling Center has been doing for the um, past year, so since January of this year. (laughs) We've been releasing a new webinar each month on a um, different topic. This month, obviously, in line with Recovery Month, we are doing a webinar based around substance abuse, um, substance use, and, you know, the recovery journey, how that actually looks, because 
Recovery is not linear. Like nothing, um, healing, anything that we're doing, trying to improve ourselves is not going to be linear. It's not straightforward. It does take some time. So I know that the webinar is going to cover, you know, the ups and downs of recovery and how to um, bounce back from it and um, the expectations of it. So you can find that on the government website. It's usually on the hub, but I don't know, everyone doesn't have access to the hub like that. So um, the the government page um, that um, it will be released on that on September 15th. And you want me to talk about uh, at first? Okay. Um, so obviously um, the Therapeutic Thursday is mainly for um, civil servants who have access to our um, our information hub. That's what we'll call it, right? And so a lot of information is shared on, on, on this page called the hub. Um, for those who obviously are not um, civil servants, we will be having an open webinar called Talk Early, Talk Often, uh, the Recovery Month edition. And we are very fortunate to have this webinar that's going to be on our social media platform. Uh, we'll also be sharing it on Bobo um, FM too. Um, so please stay tuned to to listen to that segment. And we're going to be accompanied by one of our parent practitioners, Miss Kenzie Wright, as well as a, teen, uh, a counselor from Caribbean Haven Residential Center. And so the this segment is really focused on substance abuse and parenting. We've touched on it today and we're going to expand a little bit more about that because I'm sure that there are a lot of questions that you may have around beginning that journey, concerns around, well, how do I have that conversation with my child? You know, the fact that I'm ready to enroll at CHRC. Kimberly has enlightened me and this is something that I'm interested in pursuing. How do I go ahead and have that conversation with my child? It is a very difficult one. You know, um, Kimberly, any tips around that just off the top of your head? Uh, just be transparent as much as possible. You know, just try be honest. Um, speak in language that your children can understand. That's so good. But yeah, but but be be open about it. Um, that will go a long way. We know that sometimes what happens when people struggle with substance use is that trust can be broken. So having those open and upfront conversations with your children can can be the first step towards rebuilding some of that trust. And so for individuals that want to access or learn more about CHRC, how can they reach you? They can call us at 947-9992. Uh, because we're a residential facility, we are there 24-7. <laughs> if you want to be admitted, that's between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. But you can call us anytime if you have questions. Okay. Um, and um, I know the Counseling Center, um, in terms of, you know, just learning a little bit more about your work and how individuals can just sign up for any of your upcoming programs or that intake process that you talked about earlier on. So, yes, you can schedule an intake appointment by calling 949-8789 and see what's available, get that appointment, and then go through that process and they'll you'll be assigned a counselor or a therapist and they will help you navigate your journey in terms of what is appropriate for you or not, and if you need um, some individual sessions with them as well. And usually it's done through like a treatment plan. It's a very collaborative approach. You and the therapist or counselor will sit down and create that plan uh, for yourself so that you have a main say in that process. Right. And so as I mentioned earlier on, for those that have been listening, as 8 p.m. when we joined on um, this call, but... um, Obviously, all three entities, FRC, the Counseling Center, as well as CHRC, we are all one. We all fall under the Department of Counseling Services. So whether you decide to email FRC at gov.ky or give us a call at 949 but your interest is really to access Counseling Center. It is really a one-stop shop. It's a very seamless process. We've done a lot of work to make sure that clients are actually or individuals that are ready to to, to make a solid change or, or to even pursue the idea of, hey, something's got to be different. You know, I need I really need to do something different for my life or just change the journey that I'm on right now. Uh, whether you start off at the Family Resource Center and we connect you with Renee or with Samuel or with a CHRC Kimberly and her wonderful staff. It is really a very, very seamless process. And we do so with a lot of passion and commitment to the work that we do. So what I'd like to do is just leave us off with, you know, from each one of you, tell us what's the biggest message that you'd like parents to leave with today, Kimberly. So I'll start. This is Kimberly from Caribbean Haven. I'd like to leave you with the reminder that there is hope, that recovery is possible, and that there is support out there for you. Parents, make yourself available to listen. Might sound obvious, but just be present so that you can listen to the issues that your children have. 
And I think it's also important, too, for parents to take care of themselves, you know, look at what's going on for you and and addressing those, um, addressing what's coming up for you. I think it's really important to take care of yourself in order to take care of anyone else. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Parents, if at any point you feel like, you know, you're interested in learning a little bit more about the work that we're doing as a department, please go ahead and give us a call. Um, you know, we, we wholeheartedly believe that we are here committed, um, passionate about the work that we do. And at the end of the day, it's all about making a difference in the lives of those that we serve and creating change, not only for yourself, but also for future generations to come. So thank you so much for listening to us, um, this evening, um, I always say, you know, when it comes to routines, routines are something that you could make so much. I mean, it's just like um, so so many opportunities to connect with your child. So maybe this evening as you're putting your child to bed or tomorrow, you know, take a little bit of what we've learned, what, what you've listened to today and have a frank conversation, whether it is, you know, hey, has, has anybody spoken to you about substance abuse? Do you want to talk to me a little bit more or any drugs or whatnot? Just keeping it as open and age appropriate as possible is probably the best, you know, advice that we can give you from a parenting standpoint and if you don't have that you know if if you feel a little bit concerned about how do I have that conversation please go ahead and give us a call we have so many resources and 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 just available parent practitioners that can support you in that process so that is it from me uh thank you so much to Kimberly from CHRC uh Renee counselor from the Counseling Center, and Samuel, who has joined us today from the Counseling Center, too. My name is Charmaine Miller, and it's been a pleasure serving you today. The Family Resource Center invite you to join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. on Bobo, 89.1 FM, for our weekly show called Rethink Parenting, where we share practical and positive parenting information to support happy, healthy family life. We'll share how to handle day-to-day issues. We'll address common challenges with parenting, such as how to manage misbehavior, supporting our teens through growing up, managing co-parenting dynamics, and how to take care of ourselves and manage our own stressors. Family Resource Center, committed to building people, building families. Tune in Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. on Bobo 89.1 FM. Find us at frc.gov.ky or call us on 949-0006. Submit your questions and concerns regarding parenting to us and we'll share them on air. Join us Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. for our 